Ward, I really don't know where to begin, but what is your earliest memory of being in the outdoors? How did that love for being outside and running through the woods first come about? Well, uh, well, was brought up at, you know, it was obviously a rural area. And I'm the oldest of uh, three boys. So when I'm, you can just envision when I'm four or five, uh, my mom's got a, uh, a kid that's three years younger than me. So you figure when I'm six, you got Jeff and in- infant, my middle son, my middle brother, uh, you know, he's three years uh, younger. So mom's got her hands full when there was a sandbox in the backyard that my dad had built. And it was like a hundred acres back there that we didn't own, but it was full of creeks and uh, wildlife. And I always had dogs with beagles. So there was nothing else for me to do. And I learned every rock and tree in that hundred acres and built dams and creeks and just, uh, that was my life. You know, I I stayed in the outdoors, particularly with my dogs and um, pretty much haven't changed since. When and how did racing first come into the picture? My dad asked me would I like to go run this dirt track uh, right up the road here in Halifax County, and he took me up there, and I said, sure, I'll do it. So I had a two-seater go-kart. Well, Dad got me a single-seater go-kart. We went up there, uh, took the lead on the last lap, got spun out. I was racing adults, by the way, so I had a hell of a weight advantage, and then pretty much lapped the field the next race. You know, it's yeah. a, 20 lap feature but anyway after that you know it was just something that came easy to me but it was dad's enthusiasm that had me doing it every weekend then as my brothers got older we all did it every weekend during the summer so you you started racing because your dad kind of was was big into it yes sir dad was always uh very competitive in everything so dad was uh just to give you how an idea of how good of an athlete Dad was, when he was in the 10th grade, he was first string varsity high school for football, baseball, basketball. I mean, just a <laughs> heck of an athlete. So yeah. Dad, comp- he's even if it's just playing a friendly game of tennis or something, he's in his mid-80s, still plays tennis, he wants to beat you very badly. I can promise you that. <laughs> Just very, very competitive. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Was there ever a point when you felt like racing was taken away from hunting and fishing and working outside, or was that always a constant? Well, it's just kind of what we did. Uh, and, you know, we all loved to do it, and Dad raced some too. So, you know, during the summertime, it didn't really take away from outdoor recreation things, from camping, fishing, hunting, and all that. Uh, my granddad was a huge role model of mine, and he uh, was retired by that time. So, you know, he was a big duck hunter, raised a big garden, uh, had a place on Bugs Island Lake. So when I wasn't uh, by myself, um, in the forest or playing with friends or racing, I spent a lot of time with my granddad. So, uh, you know, it was just a natural thing. I never really gave it any thought. You know, we we had free time to enjoy the outdoors and we raced during the summer. My younger brother is six years younger than I am, and I, I know how I felt about him tagging along and pestering me and my friends. What was it like for you being the older brother with two younger brothers? Well... So Brian and I always uh, did some things together, but it's a lot of difference like when you're nine and a brother's six and the other one's three. Yeah. So, you know, I was so much older than Jeff, you know, five and a half years. There wasn't much that I could include Jeff yeah. with. Yeah. And they were just in my way, be honest with you. Cause I, <laughs> you know, whether I'm catching snakes or I'm <laughs> – uh, bagging squirrels with my BB gun or my beagles and I rabbit hunting, you know, <laughs> this was serious occupations, you know. <laughs> I didn't want yeah. I didn't want little kids messing it up. <laughs> <laughs> now I did not know this until I started digging up some questions for this interview, but you actually attended Hargrave Military Academy in Chatham. 
was that your choice or was that maybe to keep you from killing your two kid brothers? It definitely was not my choice. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I could have taken the easier route uh, many times in my life, and that's one of the best examples. All I had to do was to do my homework, get my priorities a little bit in order, uh, be more respectful to my parents, and so I took the hard way. You know, I was skipping school here locally, going out to the Cove is what we call it, which is now a foundation property and, you know, partying and uh, chasing girls like guys supposed to do. And so, no, I, I was boarding at a, a Hargrave for three and a half years, but it was, uh, you know, look, at the time it was a prison. Oh, yeah. I got yeah. to come home twice a semester, and I'm only 30 minutes from, from home in Chatham from Halifax. So, you know, while all my friends was able to uh, have some freedom, but I did it 100% to myself, but I learned so much at Hargrave about the chain of command, and uh, I loved the military part and the structure of it. It was good for me, and, and my parents should have sent me a year or two before they did. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what years did you did you actually graduate from there? Oh yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, graduated in eighty one, and uh, was sent there in probably uh, seventy seven or something like that. So how I was sixteen when you went? Yes. What were those first few days and weeks? I like? walked a lot of bull ring. You know, bull ring is you get a certain amount of tours. You got like say you got twenty free tours. Well, after that, every tour you got an hour walking the bull ring, full dress uniform with a M1 on your shoulder. And it was about uh, like someone telling me to clean the latrine. And you know, what I didn't know at the time is you have to be a follower and do what you're told to do before you can be a leader. Yeah. And uh, I conformed, still got away with a lot of stuff that <laughs> I got caught for some things. I got away most most things, <laughs> but I've never been a complete conformer and a uh, following the rules. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, I graduated uh, second lieutenant, so I was second in command of a company. Each company had about eighty-five students. You know, it was about six hundred kids going there at the time. So, you know, we all go through different things in life. And as I look back at that time, one, I needed it. It helped get my priorities in order. It didn't help me with my work ethic because I already had a work ethic from the construction yeah, company yeah. my dad uh, was running it. My granddad uh, founded years ago, but uh, it was it was uh, now treasured memories. Was the military something that you considered as a career? Well, if I hadn't gone to Hargrave, I would join the Marine Corps. If you had not, yes. Okay, but after going to Hargrave. You, you know, found out the military was not for you. No, I, I, I actually <laughs> yeah. love the military. Okay. Yeah, we, we support the military in a lot of different ways that we'll get into sometime during this interview. It was just I needed some freedom. Yeah. I mean, I was on the drill team at Hargrave, and we had uh, the national drill team come and help train us for a competition we were doing in Arlington. And so these kids were two years older than I were. They're 18, 19, you know, I'm 16 to 17, and they were like, I don't know how in the world you kids do this because we were literally in a prison-type atmosphere because we just didn't have the freedoms, right? And it's nothing against Hargrave. That's yeah. just the way I was perceiving it at the time. And even when they were active military, they had more freedoms. I mean, we didn't go home on the weekend. We pretty much uh, Hargrave bound. But, again, Hargrave's a great institution. Uh, they're struggling more now because parents, uh, my generation, are a lot softer than when, Ricky, your parents and my parents were raising us up. And there's a, it's still a great institution for kids, not that need help or have some uh, disciplinary issues, but you just learn a lot, you know. Jeff has said that in the beginning there was a little bit of tension between the two of you as you were coming up the ranks, uh, racing and everything. 
there's race intention, then there's family tension, and neither are very easy to deal with. How did you handle it? Well, my parents got a divorce about the time Jeff was uh, 15, 16. You know, I was already in college at Elon uh, in North Carolina. So Dad, Dad took Jeff straight from go-karts to late model stock. Yeah. Uh, to try to, you know, it, obviously being a younger, if any divorce, it was affecting him more than like it would me or, or even Brian for that matter. So Dad was doing what Dad thought he needed to do to help Jeff you know, overcome all these uh, family issues. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a pill for Brian and I to swallow. But, you know, hey, man, uh, the youngest always gets a little bit more of a silver platter. Right? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot, you know, a lot of times it's oh, yeah. just simply yeah. because yeah. it happened with my daughter. My yeah. daughter's yeah. the oldest, but we didn't have any resources. Yeah. I mean, we were living from paycheck to paycheck. Well, here comes Jeb. I'm racing. I've gotten to where I'm racing for a living. I'm making some money. When when Tab and I were married with Sarah, you know, we just we just did we didn't have enough money to buy a swing set. Yeah. So you know, it's just it's just a natural involvement. It wasn't anything uh, personal toward everything. And as I look back on it, Jeff did Jeff have an easier ride? Did he have a silver platter? Absolutely. Did he ever work a day in construction? One. You know, so with, it's almost yeah. like if you have a yeah. family yeah. farm, yeah. man. If yeah. you have a yeah. family farm, everybody pitches in, right? There ain't no damn exceptions unless someone is ill. Yeah. Well, Dad didn't make Jeff do that. Yeah. He was able to work on a race car. So, you know, all of us at that time, we worked on race cars after your eight-hour shift or whatever it was was going on, whatever you're doing to make a yeah, living. You, yeah. Nobody raced full-time in late model or street stock or nothing back in them days. But, it's, hey, it's just it's just the way it was. Now, you went to Elon? Yes, sir. Did you graduate? No. Okay. Right. I went two and a half years, uh, came home, and um, my mom and dad and I were having a discussion, and philosophy came really easy to me. I could make good grades, and I was a little bit interested in, in that. And Dad said, heck, you can't make a living doing that. You're going to have to take some business courses. Well, I tried to take economic business during summer. That didn't go too well, so I quit. Now, what was your major? Never never declared oh, okay, a major okay, because right. they, okay. they basically wasn't going to fund it if I was going to uh, major in philosophy. You wanted to major in philosophy? It just came easy to me. Oh, I've always, wow. yeah. So anyway... Um, I uh, quit college, uh, jumped on my 745 Honda, drove to Florida, so my dear friend uh, C.R. Sanders and asked him could I live at the lodge, which was an old tobacco barn that had a chimney and a rock floor. And he said, sure, and he had me do this and that for the farm. But I went and lived in the woods for two years. Did you really? And... Uh, grand time in my life. I didn't I really had no responsibility other to keep myself fed. You know, I had I had a ball. Wow. <laughs> so no, I didn't graduate from yeah. college. Um there was this pretty infamous incident between you and Jeff at South Boston where one of you took the other out. Yep. Uh then you kind of proceeded to have at it after the race. What do you remember about that night? Uh, Bobby Moon was leading the race. I was second. And I'd arced a little wide trying to uh, get under him because I was going to pass him. And Jeff just drove it in there, and so we both crashed. And uh, I was driving for someone else at the time. And uh, <laughs> I went to the pits because Dad spotted for Jeff. So I went to Jeff's pit stall and Two, Mr. and Mr. Mr. and uh, Mrs. Uh, Rice were there, and they kind of blocked me. And I said, "Look, I'm gonna just talk to him." And they let me, they let me through, <laughs> and I had him by the, I had him by the damn uh, collar, and uh, then I saw Dad coming. Uh oh! And Dad would whip all of us butts, and I got plenty of stories. In front of God and everybody. I, yeah, so I knew I needed to get the heck back of my pistol. But I mean, be honest with you, after that. Um, 
you know, I think uh, who's ever thought it would. I think we both learned a lot. And, you know, we might have rubbed fenders or something in all the years after that, but we never crashed one another from, from that moment forward to the, to the end of our racing careers. So you go out and you live in the woods, spend some time there. Um, how did the Bush Series come into the picture? You ran your first basically full season in 1990 with Sam Ard and Mike Swaim. How did that, that come That was – uh, so Jeff drove for Sam Ard. Yeah. I did. You did not? No. No, Jeff drove for Sam Ard. Dad funded two years of Jeff driving for Sam Ard. Okay. Yeah. Racing Reference has you with, with Sam. No, that yeah. was, that was okay. Jeff. That okay, was Jeff. all right. So you were running for Mike Swain? Yes, sir. That was my first uh, big break. Um, so, you know, it, it went from uh, I quit running go-karts when I was 16, still at Hargrave because they wouldn't let me out during the weekends. And then uh, I bought an XR75 in um, early 80s and uh, race motocross for two years because it was the only thing I could afford. I, I took a loan out and bought a bike and the gear and all that yeah. stuff. Won a few races, but I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that good. Um, but anyway, uh, so when I came out from living at the Cove, I went to a race because I went back to, excuse me, I went back to working for Jay Burton Construction. And I went to a race one weekend, a fella, uh, Carl Long, offered me a Volkswagen to race. A race Volkswagen? That, yes, sir. Raced that two weeks. A and Beetle? Then, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Carl Newble, a local gentleman here, he just passed away a few years ago, he was building an old street stock, 72 Nova. I can remember helping him straighten the snout with a chain and a tied to a pickup in a, tr in a tree. So, I mean, that's, you know, but it did have racing tires, you know, had 350 motors. So it was a, when I got in that the first night, I bounced off the walls, the cars were tough, should have won the race, had a lap car. You know, I didn't have no patience. I'm just balls to the wall. Uh, had a lap car get me sideways the last lap, finished second. Once that happened, everything else came second. The, you know, I was single at the time, the girls, the party, and the hunt, and the outdoor, everything came after the race car. I didn't, I didn't do any of that other than work construction for my dad's construction company if the race car wasn't ready. Racing the Volkswagen Beetle? Well, the street stock, the 72 okay. Nova. Yeah. Okay. So once, once that happened, uh, pretty much I was, I was hooked. Never thinking that we're going to turn into a career, but right, it's just right. something I, you know, it just brought back all of that training that uh, we had in the go karts. Not not the Volkswagen, but that '72 Nova. Wow. So how did the deal to go to the Bush Series come about? Just worked my way up, you know. Uh, ran that a year and a half. Uh, the street stock. Uh, gentleman named Goo Fallen built me a late model. I ran for him two years, and then I ran, ran for Dad uh, probably another year and a half or so. So um, they started the sportsman class, Humphrey Wheeler did yeah. in Charlotte. Yeah. Went down there with uh, Mr. Temple and put our late model motor on it. We had a radiator problem, but we sat on the pole, led almost every every lap, blew a left rear tire with a few laps to go. So I, I knew at that moment I need to be I need to be on these bigger tracks. It just was it just came real easy. And then Ed Free loaned myself and Dad a bush car. Okay. I drove to Pennsylvania in my bread truck in the open trailer. Stayed a day or two with Mr. and Ms. Free and brought it back. And we went to Martinville with my late model crew and didn't make the race by time. But they had two heat races. We won the heat race at Martinville. Yeah. And finished like 
14th and 15th during the feature. Little did we know we need to get a whole lot more forward bite <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on the exit of those yeah. corners. But, uh, man, that was, you know, that, that Ed Free giving us the car. And then I met Mike Swain at Rockingham. And uh, Mike convinced the uh, uh, Catherine Garner, the, one of the owners of Texas Peak, to let me and Morgan Shepard share the ride. And that was the big break. And, and my biggest break, we had, we had some awesome, awesome runs that year, but we went to Charlotte and we ran with Harry Gant and Sterling Marlin and uh, outrun most of the cup guys all day long. And we, you know, we were running top five to top seven uh, all day, and that was kind of unheard of of Bush guys to run with the Cup guys at the time. Yeah. Uh, got a lot of that, lot of exposure, and that that was really that was really my big break. Now you started out in 1991 driving for Charlie Henderson. Yes, sir. And then you moved over to Alan Dillard's 27 car about halfway through the year. What happened? How'd that come about? Mm -hmm. Mr. Henderson, a uh, great guy, you know, we, we just didn't have the resources. So, you know, um, when Mr. Dillard called uh, Dad and I and we met in Charlottesville, you know, man, the minute I got in his race cars, we were running good. I mean, we were running competitive right off the bat. And Mr. Dillard passed away. Um, Last year, went to his funeral. You know, he uh, he gave me a my first big break. So that that's when I was racing full time. Right. Because when I was driving for Mr. Henderson, I was working construction, yeah, and racing. And I would drive back and forth to uh, to Abington, Virginia, from Halifax every week. And uh, yeah, so Mr. Dillard really gave me a great opportunity. Nineteen ninety two, you start out third at Daytona behind Dale Earnhardt and the defending Daytona 500 winner Ernie Irvin. That must have been a pretty big deal for you personally. We ran up front all day. I, we should have won a couple of those races. I mean, I can remember one. We, we had – Ron Hutter was building the motors, and we had something, and I, I'm not very mechanically – savvy but something with the distributor box and i can't remember what it was it, it messed us up quite a few races we got laps down coming and uh and fixing that issue went out there and there was a train of six of them of course earnhardt's leading yeah passed every one of them passed every single one of them got in front of dale coming off of two and then i just went high because i was so many laps down let them go i did uh i did help pushed Jeff to a decent finish uh, that day. But, yeah, man, I, I love those bigger tracks. If that was big, you go to the next race at Rockingham and you win the first race of your Bush Series career. And the next three guys in the running order are all in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, Mark Martin, Davey Allison, and Dell Earnhardt. What do you remember about that day? You know, Rockingham was a place that just uh, – I, I knew what I needed at Rockingham or Darlington. Yeah, you know, I, I just it would eat the tires up, and I, I like that. I like it to tire to fall off. I felt like it put a little bit in the driver's hand, but my car was working really well. You know, the front end was turning. I had great forward bite on exits, and you know, at those tracks, the biggest thing is is the front end just slide. You know, if 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 the, if your car is turning. And I'm sliding. <laughs> you're going. Yeah. You're going to pass me. You know. Yeah. So my car was turning really well. And uh, hey, man, we we were we were in the sink. You know, Rick Wren was doing a great job uh, being the crew chief. Uh, Mr. Dillard was giving everything we needed. I can remember Elliot uh, leading the race at a few times, passing him. Uh, Davy Allison and I battled a lot. Earnhardt a little bit so, but Davey uh, passed him coming out of four for the uh, for the win. And <clears throat> one of one of the most things I remember about that day was after the ceremony and all that stuff. You know, we were hanging on the, the back stretch and Mr. Dillard saw a haul and all that, and there come Davey Allison. 
And I mean, uh, just, and I've done a few things on social media since then, just a, just a stand up great gentleman, uh, for him to take the time to come to speak to a pretty much a nobody in the sport, right? Particularly in the Grand National, just meant a, meant a ton. And, and he said, because when, when we came off of four, I didn't give him much room. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was dripping yeah, up, yeah. and I mean, I was right, I was right yeah. there, you know. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't touch him. I drove him clean. They drove me clean. But he said, look, you, you, you drive me clean, I'm going to drive you the same way. But anyway, just, just always a stand-up guy. I, I got a big poster. He had a, he had a uh, real close friend, a, a gentleman named Tommy Harkelroad in Bristol. And I did too with Tommy. So uh, I've got a picture framed in my basement at home with me and Davey and Tommy at Bristol uh, wow. eating breakfast together. Was that the race that put you on the map, so to speak? I don't know. You know, I don't know. It, um, it was um, it was just some good times. You know, that was the old Buick so that was the same year the Luminers had come out. And so we won the race with the Buick. Well, when Rick started uh, bringing out the Luminers, you know, Mr. Dillard built us a couple of new cars. Little did Rick know, but they had left the residual valve in the brake system, which means what it does when you push the brake down, it keeps the pads on the rotors. And so we went for months running these luminous where we're burning the damn rotors up oh, at wow. places where you yeah. don't even hardly use brakes, yeah, yeah. like Orange County or uh, some of the other tracks. And, I mean, our performance just went from here to here over this yeah. simple little thing. Wow. And the next year, Freddie Fryer found it during the off-season because I can remember what I was doing that moment when Freddie called me and said, <laughs> I fixed your damn brake problem. <laughs> so, I mean, really, Rick, Rick was a great crew chief. He could give me – and he was a crew chief when I, we were driving for uh, Texas Pete and Mike Swain. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Rick could make me haul the freight, man, and uh, that little residual valve really, really messed us up. 